Hi, I'm Lawrence Brown, a person the Bloomington Gazette once called America's finest British import. A few weeks ago, I did something that eight-year-old Lawrence wouldn't have believed even if you'd bribed him with curly whirlies. It was the life event to end all life events, and I know what you're thinking. So what was this big life event then? Oh, don't worry about all of that. All will be revealed in an upcoming special. That upcoming special is this one. And this life event didn't pertain to a newborn baby or the genuine imprisonment of Uncle Toby. It pertained to my residency status. Basically, to cut a long story short, in the last few weeks, I secretly became a US citizen without telling anybody. I mean, I told the US government, obviously, just not anybody else. I wanted to save the news for this very video so that you and I could party together, but make no mistake about it, I also did it for the clicks. For those of you not familiar with my work, you might be wondering, who the heck are you? Why and how did you become a US citizen? Does this mean you're American now? And what are your thoughts on tests that don't provide answer choices? The answers to all of these questions lie ahead, so keep watching the video, and if you haven't subscribed to this channel, do that now. Over the years, I've been asked by fellow Brits, how does one go about becoming a citizen of the United States of America? And just as with Lawrence, where did you put the leftover pizza? My answer was always going to disappoint some. Because the truth is, I'm not an expert on all of the paths to citizenship. The one to which I am most attuned is citizenship by marriage. In the halcyon days of 2008, I married Tara, my American fiancé, at a courthouse in the bountiful kingdom of Indiana. On the big day, it's I found myself contending with Midwestern influenza, sub-zero temperatures, and an uninvited guest called Vince. All told, my wedding day was only the 541st best day of my life. But ultimately, we were happy because it meant we could now more easily live together in the same country. To facilitate this, I successfully applied to become a resident of the United States. This should not be confused with President of the United States because that generally comes with a bigger house. It is under this status, equipped with a permanent resident card, that I have legally resided in the United States ever since. But I was never, under any legal definition, considered American, just a British person who happened to live here under certain limitations. This year, I applied to remove those limitations, which, among other things, included restrictions on voting. This in particular seemed really important, especially since my wife's cousin Chad likes to send me Twitter polls. But more than anything, I chose to apply for US citizenship because a big part of me feels American. And I know what you're thinking, Ooh, Lawrence, you're still every bit an Englishman, right down to your accent and dental work. And this is true, which is why I'm pleased to report that as a dual citizen, I get to keep my British passport and dental work. But that does not mean that the process of becoming a citizen was all plain sailing. In fact, despite my association with ponds, there was not much sailing involved. First and foremost, as the law states in 2022, I needed to have lived in the United States as a lawful permanent resident for at least five years. This was achieved as long ago as 2014, leading detectives in the comments section to ask, why did it take so long for you to get your citizenship? Good question, the answers to which are numerous. Firstly, I, Lawrence Brown, am irredeemably lazy, the sort of person who leaves one sheet of toilet paper on the roll just to avoid switching it out. We all have our demons. Secondly, a big part of my small brain... <laughs> Secondly, a small part of my big brain occasionally convinced itself that obtaining US citizenship would result in the loss of my British passport. This is false and a testament to my laziness that I failed to test its validity sooner. And thirdly, money. When you're hard up for cash just as I was in 2014, it's more difficult to justify the $640 filing fee and $85 biometrics fee. This non-refundable amount is due at the time that you file N400. And while that might sound like an overly CG CGI droid from the prequels, it's a very important form. Basically, it's what alerts the United States government to your intention to apply for citizenship. It also helps them determine if you're even eligible. Spoiler alert, I was! Once I'd answered questions about my marital status, travel history, personal character, the Constitution, the Pledge of Allegiance, and Uncle Toby, the USCIS approved me for an interview, English test, and knowledge test. As I folded the letter back into its envelope, I felt a strange sense of calmness, as if I were floating through the clouds like a helium balloon given to me by my niece before a deeply specific incident on Christmas Day. Sorry about that. <laughs>
Everything should be a piece of cheesecake from here, I thought, and initially this is how it seemed. The interview was similar to the one I'd had for my residency all those years ago. Now equipped with vastly more life experience, people skills, and anti-aging cream, I had no problems. And the English test, a set of rudimentary questions designed to gauge a person's proficiency in speaking, reading, and writing. With English being my first language and the one I studied at university, this was basically a formality. The, alumin the aluminum foil was placed in the drawer. And then the knowledge test. Surely I couldn't fail the knowledge test. I'd been gearing up for this since I was 10 years old, when my father bet me that I couldn't name all 50 states. I mean, I live for American trivia, right? Just this month, I practically breezed my way through a Britannica quiz on that very subject. Four years ago, you even saw me sail through a citizenship practice test. Again, the sailing bit was a metaphor. The truth is, you only had to get six questions right out of ten. Surely I wouldn't crumble now, right? Up came the first question, verbally read to me by the USCIS agent. Question one. Name two cabinet level positions. Wait, is that... is that it? What happened to the answer choices? Okay, keep calm, Lawrence. Stiff up a lip, stiff up a lip. You obviously didn't read the instructions carefully. That's definitely on brand for you. Just stay calm. The vice president and the president. Oh, you idiot. Not the president. The president's the one with the big house. You should have said something like the vice president and like uh, the secretary of housing and urban development, who ironically has a smaller house. <laughs> Question two, who makes federal laws? I can't believe it's not multiple choice. How did you miss that? All of the practice tests were multiple choice. You're going to lose and everyone's going to think you're a fraud. Congress? You did it. Congress is the right answer. You're back in the game. Remember, you have to get six out of ten to pass. Question three, what does the Constitution do? It presides over the rights of Americans. Ugh! Presides over? Why did I say that? Question four. During the Cold War, what was the main concern of the United States? You scored big with that one. Here comes question eight. We elect a senator for how many years? It's six. It's six. It's definitely six. Four. Good effort. But the answer is six. And Lawrence, you know what that means. Everything now hangs on these last two questions. If you get both right, you're walking out of here a US citizen. If you get even one wrong, you're going home. Wait, going home? As into your house. Don't worry, you're not being deported. Oh, <laughs> thank goodness. So, question nine. Name one of the writers of the Federalist Papers. Sometimes in life, to move forward, you have to go backward. No sooner had the words left her lips that I remembered this question came up on the practice quiz four years ago. On that day, in that very video, even with multiple options, I got it wrong. Fool! The truth is, back then, I didn't even know what the Federalist Papers were, so to correct this, I went out and bought my very own copy a few weeks later, as evidenced by this Instagram post from the Blue Glasses era. The first thing that I noticed about it was that one of its writers was also the central figure in a musical that had just become a global phenomenon. I wondered pretentiously to myself if I might now be in the room where it happens. Alexander Hamilton. That's correct. Final prompt, name one of the two longest rivers in the United States. At this point, there were two things I could not believe. Firstly, that this precise question popped up at such an important moment in my life. And secondly, that the quiz master clearly hadn't seen my video, British Rivers Ain't Got Nothing on America. If she had, she'd realize I was well versed in my American waterways and that I knew the Missouri to be the longest. She'd also know that I'd taken multiple boat rides along the second longest and learned to spell it in school. M I double -S, S double I. Double S. Just the name will suffice. The Mississippi River. Congratulations, you passed. Yes!
As if to underscore the trajectory my life had now taken, the first thing I saw upon exiting the field office was the Sears Tower. Could it be that my childhood fixation with it, planted there by my father, ultimately led to this moment? Yes, but of course I still wasn't technically a citizen yet. After all, I still had to attend the swearing-in ceremony. This usually happens in one of two ways. Either you're sworn in on the day of your interview and declared a citizen there on the spot, or like me, you'll receive an invitation in the mail to turn up at a designated location several weeks later. The designated location in question was the Wintrust Arena here in Chicago, the date December 7th, 2022. When I arrived, I was surprised to find a huge line had formed outside the building. A Ukrainian man asked me if this was the line for new citizens. Turns out, it was. There were so many of us, in fact, that we had to take a seat in the actual arena. What's all this about, I thought? Were they forcing us to watch a game of basketball as a rite of passage? Not quite. It quickly became clear that the plan was to swear all of us in at once. And it was a good thing, too. With almost 2,000 new citizens in attendance, this was officially the largest naturalization ceremony in Chicago's history. In unison, we stood for the national anthem. We stood for the Pledge of Allegiance. I even tried to get a wave going, but the Dutch couple next to me weren't having it. And then came those words. Congratulations! on becoming a United States citizen. It was official. The English child who'd obsessed over American textbooks had become, 30 years later, a textbook American. Ladies and gentlemen, we got him. And that's the story of how I became a citizen of the United States. In the new year, join me for more Final Friday specials as I go to the very depths of the pond and uncover memos about my new homeland that you didn't even know existed. Thank you for watching this video and sharing it with all of your friends, especially my fellow Americans. Until next time, see you later dudes. I'm never saying that again.